uh, welcome everyone. We're going to move to the second delightful part of the course in as far as we're going to move on to Mr. J.R.R. Tolkien. Some of you have been waiting for this eagerly and uh, the rest of you have yet to know the delights that you would have been anticipating uh, if you knew better. Uh, he's, he is by some accounts the author of the century. That's uh, what Tom Shippey calls him, Shippey who knew him personally. Um, it was also the award that he was given while I was in Britain in the year 2000, uh, studying in Durham University still at the same time. And he was awarded that twice by the British public. And you know, these, are, these were popular votes. Um, but it was confirmed within, within a month, more or less. And uh, that he was the author of the century. And uh, it was interesting to me to see the, uh, the sort of the backlash against it in academia and uh, in official uh, British circles, not the popular view, but rather what the people thought. <coughs> the academics, by and large, were uh, scornful, dismissive. And I guess probably for good reason, because I don't think Tolkien has studied in universities <coughs> any more than uh, Lewis is as a writer of fiction. Both men are pretty highly regarded, I think, at least in s certain of their works amongst the academic community. Uh, Tolkien himself was the Bosworth chair uh, of, um, of medieval uh, literature is what he looked at, and he was a, an Anglo-Saxonist and a specialist in Norse literature, furthermore, a position which he occupied for many, many decades. And uh, interestingly, at least for me, personal connection, my, the, the lady who taught me uh, medieval literature as an undergrad and taught Anglo-Saxon, all the same sorts of things, uh, studied with Lewis and Tolkien uh, in the 50s. Uh, as an undergrad, she went to the public lectures, so she had some anecdotes about that which I found interesting, even though I didn't know really who they were at the time. That shows you how ignorant I was. Uh, and I didn't read their work until I was an adult. I had friends saying, you should read The Lord of the Rings, you should read Narnia, whatever, and I was like, nah. I don't know why I didn't read it, it's extraordinary. If I had read it, it w I would have loved it, I think. Um, but I didn't read it the way I did uh, for the first time. I, did, I, I read it as a Christian for the first time. So I read it, and, and as a man in his, I guess in his 30s, early 30s, first time I encountered either of them uh, in their fictional writing. I read both of them uh, as scholars because I was interested in medieval uh, academic things. So I, uh, that was my, my first encounter was academics. So I, and I think that's unusual. I don't think that's the common access point to the work of, of the two men. But it was mine. And uh, he uh, is a very different figure than Lewis, I think, in many ways. Temperamentally different. Uh, uh, again, my professor, Elizabeth Revel was her name, uh, s described him as, as shy, and uh, at least in his demeanor. And, and not very <coughs> impressive. Uh, when he lectured, I think he sat at the, you know, at the front of a lecture hall, not many people there, because you don't have to go to the public lectures. They're available there. Um, the teaching happens in tutorials, one-to-one, -one, and there are a, a certain number of public lectures which you're required to deliver. So at Oxford, you will be a member of a college and you'll be a part of the university, two separate roles. In college, you'll do tutorials with individuals in your room. And at the same time, you're hired by the university to deliver lectures. And so that's where she encountered them uh, in the public lectures. And she said, Tolkien was not a very good lecturer. Um, he read his notes. So it was very interesting, but he had to strain to hear him. And Lewis, she said, packed the room, and you could hear him down the hallway with the booming voice and uh, the exuberant personality uh, that he's sort of famous for, and something that Treebeard is modeled on him. 
Um, and that's probably, probably the case. And Lewis probably makes Ransom, whom we just met, uh, models him after Tolkien. So the fat, middle-aged, bald, yeah. So that's, and that's sort of painful, you know, and no clothes at that. Um, you can imagine what that would have been like sitting over pints and laughing uh, at what you have done to your friend in fiction uh, under the guise of another name. Anyway, uh, forget that. Um, but what I admire about Tolkien is his, uh, his, commit his rigorous academic commitment to a certain view of language and literature that is rooted in language and not in the literature per se, but he sees the literature flowing out of the language. And so one of the things that most of us don't really get into, including me, is uh, learning his, his invented languages, which he does actually create. He creates a world of uh, languages for his fictional beings, the elves. There's el there are certain elven languages. And he sees the languages giving rise to the, uh, to the myths and the stories. And there's a sort of identity that comes out of language. And so with that approach to literature in mind, there's a, there's a very different way of looking at the study of literature than you would find almost anywhere, including in my classroom, because I'm not teaching medieval. Um, but I actually do hold to something of the view that's there uh, articulated, which is that the, the roots of the language are part of the identity of the, the people that use it. And <laughs> when I say the roots of the language, I'm talking about the etymology, which is the study of the roots and origins of the words that you use. And uh, that over time, we all know that language is changes in its usage and application and its uh, connotations. But the original, and, and that's recorded in historical dictionaries like the Oxford English Dictionary, if you ever see the 20 volume um, work, it's, it's very different than the Webster's Dictionary or the, all those online things, which aren't even really dictionaries, but, uh, but definitions which they can keep on changing and come up with new words and invented terms and so forth. But it rec the Oxford English Dictionary records the first use of each word in the language, when it was used, by whom, with what meaning, and it will give you, for certain words, a very long list of the usage and how it changes over time, and, and particularly how it's used often by significant authors. <coughs> and with that etymology in mind, how later writers will, will know that word and they will use it as a sort of a, a double connotation in their own, and so there's a richness in words that uh, goes beyond the mere, here's how our culture uses this word. It, it, so it has one meaning. It doesn't have layers or depths. It can't be construed in other ways. If you're going to read The Lord of the Rings, you're going to find that Tolkien's language is m enormously rich and evocative, even his English, never mind the, la the languages he invents. But even his use of English has that sort of richness to it. And, um, and I admire that. I think it's great. And uh, medieval literature in uh, medievalists, just like classicists, um, there is a real body of knowledge there which you can't fake. If you know a language, you know it. And if you don't, everyone knows that you don't know it because th there's a right and a wrong. Right? Either you know the declensions and the uh, accidents and the ways that you use, uh, the words are used and how they're used and the tendencies of the syntax, etc., or you don't. And everyone who knows or is an expert in the field will know immediately whether you know what you're talking about or whether you're talking as if you know something and you actually don't. So I like that about the classical, classical studies in medieval. Uh, and it has a sort of a, 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 a rigor and a solidity to it, which modern English, especially contemporary English, just simply lacks. <coughs> and with that in mind, what, what Tolkien does is he not only has this deeply rooted view of language and a deeply rooted view of myth, but he also has a, 
the best I can describe it, he, he has a cathedral view of the way in which everything holds together. There's a place for everything. And there's a right place for everything. And there's an ordering to it. So I, I've been promoting classical education for 20 years. And <coughs> classical education talks about foundations. It also talks about the, uh, the, the, what a finished person should look like. We have an idea of what your ideal graduate should be able to know, how he should be able to act, uh, the sort of uh, worldview he'll possess, whatever. You have that in mind, and for a Christian it's easiest is Jesus. Jesus is the, the goal. We're trying to make everybody like Jesus. Well, how do we get people so that they're able to think and act like Jesus, knowing that we're not going to be able to do it, but still, there's the goal. And the answer is you have to build certain foundations. There's certain stages that build up to that. So it's, it's the opposite of the modern uh, romantic ideal of you invent yourself. You're an orphan. You establish your own identity. You find your own path in life. And everyone else marvels at what you've made of yourself. You're the self-made man. <laughs> a Christian view, and it fits very much with a classical view, has already an idea of what a finished person looks like. And and, and there's the model of excellence, and you, if you deviate from it, then you're no longer excellent. You're deficient in certain ways. So that's what I remember we were talking about, the devolutionary and evolutionary views that Lewis was talking about and the tendency to flatten reality. <coughs> uh, that's very much what's at work here, but there's a greater consistency in Tolkien. He has a model of the way things were in their perfection, and the way they ought to be if we're to make them perfect again, and we're to measure up to that. But there's been a devolution. There's an account of the fall. I'll, I'm going to talk about that today in talking about uh, Tolkien's account of uh, Mythopoeia. And we're going to read that poem, Mythopoeia, in which he talks about our relation to myths. Very important talk. It's based on a very important that talk that Tolkien gave uh, with C.S. Lewis uh, in Christchurch Christ Church Meadows, I believe in 1929, um, which was instrumental in Lewis coming to faith. When they were talking about mythology and their shared love of mythology, and uh, Lewis commented that m myths were, were lies breathed through silver. So lies, but beautiful lies. We wish that they were true. And we delight in their beauty but they're not actually true. And Tolkien disagreed sharply with him on it and wrote the poem that we're going to read in response to it. <laughs> but it was rooted in, in Tolkien's own view of a, a solid, cosmic structure of all life and all knowledge that it was our task as educators and as human beings to fit into. And so in the discarded image, uh, Lewis defines a trait that all medieval shared. And I'm going to quote here. He says, Med the medieval man was not a dreamer nor a wanderer. That's the romantic. He was an organizer, a codifier, a builder of systems. He wanted a place for everything and everything in the right place. Distinction, definition, tabulation were his delight. And so we, it's an entirely rational universe. It's ordered, it's good, it's beautiful, it's true. And as I say, it's like a th cathedral. You've got to lay a deep foundation, and then you build up over the course of how long does it take to build a cathedral? 100 years, generations. People start it, and they die. They don't finish it. The next generation comes along, builds. They pass away, and then the third generation finally finishes it, and everyone marvels at it. But it's literally a project which they had in mind, here's what it's going to look like when it's done, and uh, it finally gets completed. Um, and they knew how it was going to be before they began it. But they're building it with stone. It did not go up in a year or two. It, went over, it took 100 years to build a cathedral. And then the inside of it and so forth, if you've ever been in them. And they, uh, it's heavily symbolic. The structure, I mean, again, it tends to be cruciform if you come from the top. And, uh, and the windows inside of it, what's depicted on them, the ordering of things within the cathedral, that's very much of the medieval view towards everything. And Tolkien, in his literature, I think, does the same thing. 
and he expresses in that a, uh, a Thomist a view of reality. I'm going to say more about that when I talk about his view of language in a couple classes. Uh, but I wanted to read a little excerpt from here on language in relation to this man, Owen Barfield. Now, I've mentioned him a couple of times and his view of language. This one's history in English words. He writes uh, others as well. Uh, but Barfield notes about language uh, something that influenced both Lewis and Tolkien. And I've talked about this already in relation to Lewis. Um, his sense of it, uh, the original sense of things not having fragmented everything into, into bits and so that they're just not only distinct but separated from one another. So the, uh, the idea of a breath and the idea of wind in the Hebrew word ruach. Right? So we, the wind outside, we don't connect it with breath at all. We can obviously see the connection because both of them are blowing air. But connecting that further to the inspiration of God is a further stretch. Barfield's contention is that people in their early origins connected all these things. And so there's a rich, dense, hard, meaningful use of language that to some degree we've lost. And it's, it's the scholars task to reconnect things that have, have uh, or, or fractured and find the roots. And Tolkien will cite that, right, at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings in reference to Aragorn, right? Deep roots are not touched by the frost. <coughs> He's a man rooted in a lineage of men. He knows who he is, although he's wandering. Right, because it's a reference to Aragorn. Not all wander who are not all who wander are lost, and he is a wanderer. But he's not a wanderer actually. He's been he's been pushed into exile. But actually, he's the only one who's connected to what's going on. He, although the world's fracturing all around him, he's waiting for his moment to come, uh, and Gandalf will find him out. But that but that sense of language as lacking any abstraction is very much what Tolkien is after in his own words and his own myths. And the myths, as I say, flow out of his words. And Barfield uh, notes that there is a relation between language and myth. In fact, he, he sees it as a direct correlation. And it's connected to the word mythos in Greek. M uh, tends to be U, um, but we, we write it as a Y in English. Uh, mythos. Uh, which is often translated just as word. Just think about that. M mythos is often translated into English as word, but think of the connotations of word in English. And then think about the theological connotations of word, the incarnational implications of word, <laughs> which will include the rational, because l with logos also comes logic, but also the mythological in the sense of a rooted, shared um, narrative on life. Christ is the logos of God. He's the word made flesh and come among us, full of grace and truth, right? So there's, a, there's the myth, the, in, there, in a sense, there's a Christian myth, which is entirely about a reality that is unshakable. Th that's at the center of the Christian faith and it's at the center of the fiction of, of Tolkien uh, is my contention. And we can, we can read this in uh, characters uh, like Treebeard, who talks about, uh, about names and says that real names will tell you the story of things they belong to in my language. Real names, so the, the predication of terms. <laughs> and so what Lewis and Tolkien also do with this view of language is they contradict the contemporary view of language that is full on embraced in academia that words do not signify anything except what we accept other signifiers. But there's no signified, there's no thing. Um, I'll talk about this if you take my uh, lit theory course next year when I talk about Augustine. He talks about race and signa. Signa being signs, rays being the things, and the signs point to things. And the race, there's something real and true there. And it's a metaphysical thing. 
and it's an unchangeable thing. And it is, a, it is as I say, not just a figment of our language or a figment of our imagination. There's something solid and real. And so the use of language in Tolkien takes on a metaphysical significance at all times. And uh, in, in his history in English words, uh, Barfield says that the word poetry, um, and he's just noting what Sir Philip Sidney and Percy Shelley and many others have noted, that word poetry in English just means to make, poesis. And a, uh, a poet is therefore a maker, and not just somebody who follows nature, which is what the Romantics contend. Right? The Romantics contend that they follow nature. Remember Wordsworth's view of language, that, uh, that, that na la nature to some degree leads him and he follows his nature. Whereas the account that we find in, in Sydney, and I would say also Coleridge, who I think disagrees with his friend Wordsworth, is that the poet is actually a maker that acts in some sense as God does. With, with this difference, that God creates things by his word ex nihilo. And we deal with things that already exist, that have been created, and we, we can name things that he has already created, and that's a creative act in itself, just by rightly naming things, finding the roots of them and using the right word but also by taking what's already given and then fabricating something new. And that's what a, a story will be, but it has to be tied to the original race. You know what I mean by race, R-E-S. Latin, Latin word for thing or substance, or from which we get uh, republic, by the way, race publica. It's the public thing, the public business. Um, and, and, and Barfield then goes on to say, um, he's not somebody that merely follows nature. He brings forth for new forms such as never were in nature. Borrowing from nothing in existence, but ranging into the divine consideration of what may be and what should be. And so he brings forth a realm of ideas. It's, not, it's very platonic in a sense. But again, Plato regar regards the ideal world of the forms of the true, the good, the beautiful, the just, etc., as what the philosopher does uh, or beholds essentially. And he says that the poets depart from. That's Plato's critique, right? And that's why they have to, they have to leave the Republic because they're always lying and they don't talk about the essence of things. But poets don't necessarily have to do what Homer did. They can speak of true things and they can build on them. And that's, that's, uh, that is going to find resonance in this work we're going to look at now, Mythopoeia, uh, which claims we make still by the laws in which we are made. That's going to be a central claim in Mythopoeia. We make still by the laws by which we are made. So there is a law that uh, an order of things, or what Lewis called the Tao, uh, according to which we can also make. But if we break the Tao, then we're no longer making, we're unmaking. We're departing from creativity and we're, we're, we're unmaking. We're uh, actually doing what Melkor does at the beginning of the Silmarillion, if you've ever read it. He sings his own song and he sings a, a, a song not of concord, but of discord, of dissonance. And thus begins the fall of the created order. So if you, you go back to Tolkien's Silmarillion and the Legendarium there at the beginning, um, Iluvatar, the, the creator, sings the whole cosmos into being, just like Lewis's uh, Aslan does in The Magician's Nephew. Remember there, the, the, the lion sings and then uh, a world comes about. Same thing in the Silmarillion, Iluvatar sings and things start separating. In the way in Genesis, it's, it's through speaking, but here it's singing. There's a beauty to it which I think is uh, a commentary on Genesis of sorts, saying that it's not just good, but it's beautiful as well as good. And the note of discord is when Melkor, because everybody else is tuning their voices to 
Iluvatars singing like a choir. But Melkor doesn't like that tune and he wants to change it a little bit. And at first, some of the others think it sounds beautiful, but eventually it plays itself out and they realize that actually it's not concord but discord and, uh, and a rebellion has begun. Because he's departed from the law laid down, which is good, true, beautiful, just, etc. Anyway, that's Tolkien's account. And the word fiction, Barfield adds, is from the word Latin uh, word fingere. So think of finger and add an e at the end. Fingere, a, a verb which means to form or to make something up. That's what fiction means. It's to, and now when we think of fiction, we think make up as in make up untruths. That's what Lewis says. It's lies, lies breathed through, through silver and Tolkien says not so. Not necessarily so. There is such thing as a true myth. The fact that we can create stories does not make, and the fact that some stories will be lies that will depart from the law of creation does not make all stories fraudulent and deceptive. You're making a, a fallacy here. Um, and, and it was persuasive to Tolkien, uh, to Tolkien, but also to Lewis. It was Tolkien's conviction by that point, very clearly. But Barfield articulated it for both men in a way that uh, they both found very helpful in their own fiction. Because I'm looking here not at Lewis's apologetics, I did that in the other course, and I'm not even looking at his literary criticism. But in his fiction, it was very important. When, remember when Ransom went to uh, you know, the Silent Planet to Malacandra and started learning the language, uh, from the Hrasa, who is a sort of a poet, remember they represented the poets, they were the ones who were gifted in language. And he had these certain biases, well these creatures must be at the bottom of the totem pole, so anthropologically, because that's the account of enlightenment anthropology, that the, the poetic age gave away to the scientific age, and then there's the people that, ru that run the show on top of that all. But first he thought it was the Sorens, but there must be the Archon, well he must be evil, like the Grand Lunar. Right, because that's the way we have come to look at societies. Um, and he finds that that sort of bias that he has is just that. It's a bias given to him, bequeathed to him by the Enlightenment, and it isn't necessarily so. Uh, the Hrasa, who are the, the, the poets of their age, uh, capture something essential that the others are not as good at. It's not they don't understand it, it's just they're not as gifted at it. But they, they all work the same way, so, whereas the Sorns are more the scientists, the rational types. Now they see things in a certain, a different way, they have certain gifts. Um, but this, but the, the Hrasa have the gifts of the poets and those are the gifts that Tolkien and Lewis especially uh, represent. I think Lewis is a bit of a Sorn as well as a Hross, myself. But Tolkien is, is all Hross, and he has no interest in Soren stuff. And, and that, therein lies his integrity. I don't mean it as a, a critique, although I'm more Lewis than Tolkien. I like both things. But there, when you, you can't do everything well, and there's a cost for doing so as well. Uh, so Tolkien, uh, as I say, who's not an impressive speaker, is is the great fiction writer of the 20th century for this reason. He builds a, an edifice that has depths that Lewis's uh, fiction does not. As much as I esteem Lewis, it's not, it's not quite the same. Uh, there's another word that Barfield mentions here in the history in English words, and that's of creating. Uh, if poets could indeed spin their poetry entirely out of themselves, they were creating gods. And, and Lewis, uh, or, or Barfield notes that the word creative is a new word. It's a neologism. It's not used by Spencer in the 16th century. They will not speak of people being creative. In English, it would only be the creator, as in God, who would have this capacity. In German, there's a special word for uh, creating that uh, is reserved for God, it's called Schöpfen. He's the Schöpfer. And a poet is a Dichter. And, and the, the, the different verb expresses a different order of making. And I think it's quite helpful in German that they've differentiated and used a totally different word. In English, we don't. 
And I think there are problems that ensue b because of that. The creator creates ex nihilo. He, le he legislates through his word in a way that is determinative of what reality is. Uh, poets, w and Tolkien's going to have to adapt to this, will sub-create that. And he makes up the word to fit uh, his understanding of how language, our language works in, in uh, conjunction and alongside God's use of language. So it's sub-creation. Note the word sub here. It's beneath that. It, it doesn't build on top of it. It's not adding to it. To some degree, it's sub. In the, in, in, in the sense with Tolkien, he's giving a prehistory of, of the Bible, even. It's the, the, the timeline for, the, for uh, the Lord of the Rings is 6000 BC. read it in his letters. He's putting it before the account of when uh, the Bible suggests that God created the heavens and the earth. He's not meaning it to be literal that way, by the way. He's just setting it in a deep, deep, deep dark. It's not medieval. It's, it's prior to all that. Uh, but creare, this verb in in, uh, in uh, Latin is heavily influenced by Christianity in medieval thought. Uh, again, Barfield, quote, its constant use in ecclesiastical Latin had saturated it with the special meaning of creating in defined fashion, out of nothing, as opposed to the merely human making, which signified the rearrangement of matter already created or the imitation of creatures. So when Tolkien uh, calls something sub-creating, um, some will say that's blasphemous for even using the word creating. Because how dare you compare, in, in a sense, just by. Um, and Tolkien's really, oper he's, he's, he, there's a middle ground there. He, he wants to lay hold, there's something divine about, about fiction. And yet, it is entirely inferior in every respect. And he will, he will lay this out in various ways and various works. Uh, I think I put on the syllabus, but I realize I, I'm coming late into Tolkien now. Uh, the, his little story called Leaf by Niggle. I don't know if you read it. In which there's a painter um, who's really a very good painter, but he is only good at painting a leaf. He can't even do the tree, but he's really good at a leaf. He's, and, and he spends his, he's painstaking and he's brilliant at being able to paint a leaf. And he keeps getting distracted by his neighbor, his neighbor's troubles, and he keeps having to go over there and he's bothered by all that. And uh, there's an account of, uh, of that. It's, it's fascinating. But what he's really doing is describing himself. He is Niggle, Tolkien. He's, all he's done in his whole legendarium is create a leaf and then there's a tree to which he's attached and which he's not even able to imagine how big it is but he's seen something of the tree in the leaf and he can capture that anyway read leaf by niggle it's brilliant and i do think it's about tolkien and about the artist's vocation and the artist taking even putting too much pride in their vocation thinking their vocation was more important than the people around them and all that so a lot of commentary there about family life and about um, living in this world and loving your neighbor and it's very wise work but it really is about the uh, the true creativity of being able to paint a leaf which nonetheless is actually a trifle compared to the tree from which the leaf um, comes right so it's just it's brilliant um, uh, I'm just not gonna be able to get into it but I wanted to mention it at least and so I think Tolkien is, is uh, operating a middle ground between the classical world, which is just sees it as imitation to some degree, and the romantics that see it as creation full-blown. The artist, at least in the uh, Shelley school of creation. Uh, he, he is in agreement more with what Coleridge will say, that uh, the imagination is the repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. That's the primary imagination and the secondary imagination takes that same uh, 
fundamental view and and adapts it and 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 may change it a little bit, tweak it a bit, but the fundamentals are rooted in what is already laid down by the m the mind of God. And the mind of God is seen in the creation of the order of things, which we can name. And again, so I said to you, I think a few classes ago, uh, when talking about language and the account of human nature, which we get in modern anthropology, man is seen as a a uh, creature that grunts and cries and makes emotive sounds and then gradually develops language. That's not the view you see in Genesis. In Genesis, God presents the animals to Adam and Adam names them. And whatever he names them, that's what it was, it says. So when he names them, the naming there is uh, an act of sub-creation in some way. Because God's already created the animal. But Adam is involved in sub-creation by actually naming what that animal is. He's saying something. So God is, to some degree, showing the grace of uh, allowing him to participate in something which he has no part in. Because when you name something, you actually do identify it. You create an identity for it. Like when you name your child, you are actually expressing a sort of mastery over the child. You don't think about it that way. Or if you name somebody four eyes when they got glasses, you are, you're, you're, you're trying to bug them or hurt them. So naming has a, has, a, has a deep effect. Or you name somebody and there can be the deep associations of that name with that person that is, expresses the love that goes with that name. So there's something very profound there and God gives that ability to Adam to do. And I think that sub-creation that's going on there uh, and I think that's what Tolkien thinks he's doing in his whole legendarium. He's getting to a deep rooted, profound, and holy occupation. Comments or questions? Because Tolkien will go so far as to call it an act of worship even. It's quite amazing. Not many people have that strong sense of vocation. I mean, Christians will say all life is, is worship, right? It says so in scripture, but do people really have that sense of reverence about their daily activities that Tolkien expresses there? And with this sort of the rigor and sense of place and sense of boundaries and also the sense of humility of, a, of niggle. You know, I'm just niggle. Yes? I think there was a bit of reverence about it, and both, but both men insisted, they didn't say analogy, although they, they, allegory, they absolutely said no. It's not allegorical. Because an allegory, remember these men are linguists, an allegory is, is, there's a literal reading and then there's a figurative reading, and the figurative reading has to match the literal reading. It can't depart from it. It's not just a, uh, you know, there's something of, of this story that's in that story. Everyone can see that in T Lewis and Tolkien's work that, you know, Aslan seems like a Christ figure. But Lewis will say, it's not an allegory. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, come on. And then he's on the stone table and he gets crucified, as it were, broken, the stone table cracks. And, and then he goes, dies, and he comes to life. And really, we're not supposed to see anything of that. And of course you are, but it's not an allegory. So he's being very, he's being pedantic. But in the pedantry, there's something significant there. You know, no, 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 it's not an allegory. But of course, this story will remind you of that story because there's only one story. There's only one true story. And that story, all sub-creation will of course evoke if it's a story at all. Otherwise, it's a non-story, it's the work of Melkor. So it has to do that. And at the same time, he, he holds the true myth of Christianity in such high regard that he doesn't want to suggest that something in his work which might be deviant from it is supposed to be an allegory of it because otherwise he's guilty of blasphemy. Right? He's very worried about that. Does that make sense? Because that's what he's after here. There's a reverence for God's word that's Im implicit in his notion of subcreation and is insistent that this is not an allegory. 
Allegories spin out of the literal in a direct. You can read it in various modes of allegory. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm doing sub-creation. Of course it reminds you of that story because all stories are that. And you know, again, that uh, fellow, the talk, Joseph Campbell, a myth with the, you know, the myth with a thousand faces or whatever, is talking about the monomyth. It's sort of leaning in that direction. Except that he's saying that they're all the same and that there's just a, there's a thousand faces on it. They're going to adamantly disagree with that. No, of course that's not true. There's only one face on it. And again, Lewis is till we have faces. Yeah, no, there's only one face. It's not a thousand faces. That's pantheism. And they're not all this. All these stories are not the same. But there's something of truth in those stories for sure. <coughs> but it's not the same thing. Otherwise, Tash and Aslan are the same being. And you can say Tashlan, right? And we worship the same God, and Aslan's snarling at that. No, 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 you can't do that. But that there's something of substance in there that's in common, absolutely, that's called the Tao. That, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it seems like, well, being pedantic, he's being, uh, I'll be pedantic. He's being pedantic, let's be pedantic with him. Because he's making it for him a very important distinction. And uh, the distinctions are what matters in language and in thought. So if you have the right words, they will direct your thoughts. So this is why we insist on the right words. And I mark people down for using the wrong words. And they get upset and say, well, you know what I meant. I said, well, why didn't you say what you meant then? I said, well, because it's the same thing, isn't it? And they know it's not. There's a right word here. You got to find the right word. That takes time. You have to know what the right words are. Again, that's, that's a, a, so how do you find the right words? Well, then you have to study the roots of languages. And so now you get the difference between Lewis and Tolkien and their school in, at Oxford University and then the modernists. The modernists didn't care about roots. They thought the language was irrelevant. Let's look at the literary features. And Tolkien and Lewis said, no, the literature comes out of the language. You can't separate them. And, and so you see that Tolkien consistently does that in his own writing to the point of creating languages for beings that he more or less invents. But when I say invent, in the sense of he discovers, he, he insists that he doesn't, he, like they come in, in venere, they're, they're discovered, they're actually there. And you can read about them in mythology. Do you not read about the elves and the fairies? We'll, we'll look at on fairy stories next time a little bit, but he says that there is such a thing as, as elves. You hear them mentioned. Tolkien talked about them in the, or Tolkien Lewis talked about them in the discarded image. He said, yeah, elves, we think of Tinkerbell, you know, these little pixies and they're unharmful. Elves in medieval literature are often terrifying beings. Tolkien thinks, leans more in that direction. There's something dangerous about an elf. That's, they're not, they're beautiful, but they're also formidable. They're older. And they are they they uh, are immortal. Furthermore, interesting. Yes. I remember um, so I used to live in Montreal, and and we start high school in grade seven. And I had an English teacher at a Christian university, a Christian school. And the running joke throughout the entire school was that she believes in in elves. I didn't understand. I was like, I was like, what do you mean she believes in elves? And everyone's like, she believes that they're real. And now, as you say that, I'm like. She's probably Absolutely. referencing that, you know, but that was, it was quite a funny thing. All the kids thought it was hilarious. Oh, they'd love it and think that she was a kook. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but. My daughter's in grade seven. I can only imagine the conversations. Yeah. <laughs> Believes in elves. And then nobody, nobody said, then how is she in a Christian school if she's, yeah, there's probably a bit of that as well. But that, that sense there, and, and Barfield notes that until the 17th century, that the word inspiration uh, implied understanding that the poets and the prophets were direct mouthpieces of superior beings. That went with inspiration. To be inspired is to be breathed into by God, godly beings, divine beings, whether, the, uh, the, whether Milton's God, who claims direct inspiration from the Holy Spirit, or in the sense of Homer and the, uh, those that are influenced by the muses, 
and feel the inspiration and they need the inspiration because they're connecting with a deep rooted story that goes beyond human telling. And that's all the way to the 17th century and then come the enlightenment that breaks, doesn't come from the gods, it comes from us and we're the gods. And that's fully presented in the romantics. But it's, it, it's in its, its nascent form in the idea of man as a being without speech that develops language through poetry. So the enlightenment breaks with the old idea of inspiration from the gods and now the inspiration comes from us, from within ourselves and then they create this mythology of the orphan which fits that idea that we're not descended or we're not created by the gods, we create ourselves, which from which we get all the contemporary craziness like gender identity and other self-identifying as who knows what, right? It's, it's just a, it's a further iteration of the same sort of process. <laughs> Made it, might sound like where did this come from? I think it, it, it goes back hundreds of years and it, it reaches its end point where now the claim of the enlightenment is that our language determines us, becomes fully articulated in the 20th century view of, of language, and uh, it is now being expressed on a personal level in terms of identification, self-identification. Yes? Would the idea of the orphan <coughs> be that, again, an orphan is somebody who has no parents, who's just been divorced from? No roots. They don't know. There's nothing. Yeah. Uh, an orphan is somebody who has, um, doesn't know about his past. He doesn't have a past. I mean, he does, but he doesn't know it. Like somebody obviously brought him to life, but they, they don't know who their parents are. They have no common history or culture, so they have to make up everything. They're like an amnesiac is another way of putting a, an orphan. Orphan is a miniature amnesiac, has forgotten the past. And that hence the importance of learning the history and the history of language. So words can't just mean whatever you say they mean. Two plus two cannot equal five. Orwell says in 1984, not only can it mean that, it does mean that if we say it does and the, the other is impossible if we say so. This is pure voluntarism that determines language. Language is not rooted to any stable reality. It's whatever the party says, that's what it means. And you will say that. And you will mean it. You'll say, well, how can I mean what I know is not true? Well, we'll have to make you forget that. And then when you've forgotten it, then we'll kill you. <laughs> total control over reality through language. Now note in Tolkien, uh, this is exactly what Sauron does with language. He unmakes or he breaks the white light and creates the coat of many colors and so forth. And Gandalf remarks <coughs> that he preferred the white. And, Ga and Sauron contemptuously says, you know, uh, the white is basically boring and the white uh, is... Uh, exhibits one reality, but here's a multiplicity. And Gandalf remarks that whoever breaks what he doesn't understand is a fool, something to that degree. And that doesn't go over very well. <laughs> I've paraphrased badly there. I used to know the exact quotation. But it's, uh, it's that sort of, it's a dispute over language and what we do when we name things. And I preferred the white light. And the white light, yes. And but look at the variety of colors here, yes. But you've broken something. And if you break something, then you're not making anymore. Philosophical point. You're breaking, you're not making. You're only making if you're doing what's already existing. So it's a, it's a view of reality. Saruman is a wizard like the Academy around Tolkien who is breaking reality and calling it creative fiction. By the way, creative writing becomes a term in the 19th century, the late 19th century. It gets taught in universities. Creative writing. And it it, needless to say, does not have anything to do with sub-creation. Oops, I keep pulling that down. I'm a little unhinged. So let me put up Mythopoeia, since I've run out of 
I'm going to run out of time, and I don't want to do that here. This will take a second to come up on the screen behind me. And again, this is a, a response. Tolkien wrote this to, uh, to Lewis after they had had this conversation in the Christchurch Meadows, and both of them were professors of literature at the time, or tutors there. Tolkien had a chair. Um, and they're walking uh, late night, they had some drinks, out for a wander in the meadows, uh, three of them, uh, Hugo Dyson as well. And uh, they had an, a discussion about mythology, which they all loved, to the point where Lewis uh, studied uh, with Tolkien and learned uh, uh, Norse and so forth, and other ancient languages. Is that working? Source searching, it must be there. There we go. So I'm just going to read it. It's not that long, but it's long enough. Uh, and then we'll just, so it's Philomythus to Misomythus. So one that loves myths to one who hates myths. A misogynist, philanthropist, the philo and miso. So from, to one who said that myths were lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through, through silver. Philomythus to Misomythus. You look at trees and label them just so. For trees are trees, and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace one of the many minor globes of space. A star is a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to courses mathematical amid the regimented, cold, inane, where destined atoms are each moment slain. At bidding of a will to which we bend and must, but only dimly apprehend. Great processes move, march on as time unrolls from dark beginnings to uncertain goals. And as on page or written without clue, with script in limning packed of various hue, an endless multi multitude of forms appear, some grim, some frail, some beautiful, some queer, each alien except as kin from one remote origo, not man, stone, and sun. Man made, God made the petrous rocks, the arboreal trees, tellurian earth, and stellar stars, and these homuncular men who walk upon the ground with nerves that tingle, touched by light and sound. The movements of the sea, the wind in boughs, green grass, the large slow oddity of cows, thunder and lightning, birds that wheel and cry, slime crawling up from mud to live and die. These each are duly registered and print the brain's contortions with a separate dent. Yet trees are not trees until so named and seen, and never were so named till those had been whose speech involuted breath unfurled, faint echo and dim picture of the world, but neither record nor a photograph, being divination, judgment, and a laugh, responsive chose that felt astir within by deep monition movements that were kin to life and death of trees, of beasts, of stars, free captives undermining shadowy bars, digging the foreknown from experience and panning the vein of spirit out of sense. Great powers they slowly brought out of themselves, and looking backward they beheld their el the elves that wrought on cunning forges in the mine and light and dark on secret looms entwined. He sees no stars who does not see them first of living silver made that sudden burst to flame like flowers beneath an ancient song, whose very echo after music long has since pursued. There is no firmament, only a void, unless a jeweled tent myth-woven and elf-patterned, and no earth unless the mother's womb whence all have birth. The heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise and still recalls him. Though now long estranged, man is not wholly lost, nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned, 
and keeps the rags of lordship one he owned. His world dominion by creative act, not his to worship the great artifact. Man, sub-creator, the refracted light through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods and their houses out of dark and light, and so the seed of dragons, t'was our right misused or misused. The right has not decayed. We still, we make still by the law in which we, in which were made rather. Yes, wish fulfillment dreams, we spin to cheat our timid hearts and ugly fact defeat. Whence came the wish, and whence the power to dream, or some things fair and others ugly deem? All wishes are not idle, nor in vain fulfillment we devise, for pain is pain, not for itself to be desired, but ill, or else to strive or to subdue the will alike were graceless, and of evil this alone is dre deadly certain, dreadly certain, evil is. Blessed are the timid hearts that evil hate, and qu that quail in its shadow, and yet shut the gate, that seek no parley, and in guarded room, though small and bare, upon a clumsy loom, weave tissues gilded by the far off day, hoped and believed in under shadow sway. Blessed are the men of Noah's race that build their little arks, though frail and poorly filled, and steer through winds contrary towards a wraith, a rumor of a harbor guessed by fate. Blessed are the legend makers with their rhyme of things not found within recorded time. It is not they that have forgot the night or bid us flee to organize delight in lotus isles of economic bliss for swearing souls to gain a Circe kiss and counterfeit at that machine produced bogus seduction of the twice seduced. Such isles they saw afar and ones more fair and those that hear them yet may yet beware. They have seen death and ultimate defeat and yet they would not in despair retreat but off to victory have turned the lyre and kindled hearts with legendary fire, illuminating now and dark hath been with lights of suns as yet by no man seen. I would that I might with the minstrels sing and stir the unseen with a throbbing string. I would be with the mariners of the deep that cut their slender planks on mountain steep and voyage upon a vague and wandering quest for some have passed beyond the fabled west. I would with the beleaguered fools be told that keep an inner fastness where their gold, impure and scanty, yet they loyally bring to mint an image blurred of distant king, or in fantastic banners weave the sheen heraldic emblems of a lord unseen. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient, before them gapes the dark abyss to which their progress tends, if by God's mercy progress ever ends, and does not ceaselessly revolve the same unfruitful course with changing of a name. I will not treat your dusty path and flat, denoting this and that by this and that, your world immutable, wherein no part the little maker has with maker's art. I bow not yet before the iron crown, nor cast my own golden, small golden scepter down. In paradise, perchance, the eye may stray from gazing upon everlasting day to see the day illumined, illumined and renew from mirrored truth the likeness of the true. Then looking on the blessed land, twill see that all is as it is and yet made free. Salvation changes not, nor yet destroys. Garden nor gardener, children nor their toys. Evil it will not see, for evil lies, not in God's picture, but in crooked eyes. Not in the source, 
but in malicious choice, and not in its sound, but in the tuneless voice. In paradise, they look no more awry, and though they make a new, they make no lie. Be sure they still will make, not being dead, and poets shall have flames upon their head, and harps whereon their faultless fingers fall, there each shall choose forever from the all. Can you not hear the echoes of the Lord of the Rings in this? Like it's just, and this is written decades before that work is published. But you can already see even the reference to the, the iron scepter and I will not bow and we may lose, but I will not retreat. And there's a still a hope. And, and the, so the, the sense of himself in the work of the Lord of the Rings. It's, it's profound. And it's profound not only in that, because the Lord of the Rings is about the, the coming of the age of men. The, the, the elves are leaving. The elves are departing from Middle Earth. There is one last battle that they will be called upon to partake in, and then they will fade away and the age of men will begin. Uh, Tolkien will be part of the age of men, and he will not lay down his fight either. And he believes in that. And he obviously, is co it's connected with using right language and saying the right things and the true things. So there's an element of um, uh, the church militant in Tolkien uh, that there's a, a battle being fought, but it's being fought in ways that are not usually uh, recognized. It's a spiritual battle, which takes place in the realm of language. That's, that's where at least he, uh, and not just language, but a myth to so the stories are deeply connected to uh, a, a view of reality. Uh, comments or questions here, or do you want anything in the, yes? Um, Dr. Matthew, what do you think of um, these, like, these characters that are like Tolkien or Romans? In Romans 1. Um, so what do I think about that? This one? Or this? I think so. yeah, yeah, Invisible yeah, things yeah, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, be understood by the things that are made? Yeah. What are the things that are made? It could be just the, what we call the natural order, but it could also be the stories, things that are made. Uh, and uh, things suggest an ordering to it because this is what you do when you make something you're suggesting an order to it and you're visualizing it and it actually works like you try and build a building that doesn't have a structure to it it doesn't it can't stand and that suggests that there is actually a structuring and an order uh, that uh, the, what we call the laws of gravity and so forth that will hold there that already suggests that there's a way and a right way to do things that sense of Again, you can't architecturally build something that doesn't follow the principles of, of, uh, of engineering, right? But that invisible order, so he's not talking there about just looking at the trees. He's talking about the way things work behind that. That's the thing that they all recognize, and that suggests that there is a, an order uh, that we can see in the realm of mathematics or, in, or even in story that does suggest uh, an invisible order. And that's exactly what he says. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. I think he's referring not to what we call the visible empirical reality, but the things that are necessary for the physical, uh, the visible empirical reality to actually exist as it does. There's something behind that. And that thing behind it suggests God. Uh, and yes, I do think he's, that's what he's saying. I do. Yeah. And that's exactly what he's getting at. Um, so he's not there by concluding from that, that all myths are the same or that it, you know, it's the hero with a thousand faces. Not, not so. Because some of the heroes uh, in those faces are, they, they have 
some of the features of this, but there's something deeply wrong about that. And they, they don't just, it's not just Tash and Aslan, and there's not a commonality, it's one hero. And they think, no, 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 it's not exact. that's the wrong way of seeing it. That's suggesting that they're all, you know, again, it's the, that story of the elephant and the five blind men that are grasping at it and says, oh, well, what's reality like? Well, it's furry and it's, you know, it's solid and it goes up and, and, and then the other has got its smooth, and it's the tusk, and the other has got his tail, and the other has got his trunk, and, and they're all saying, well, that's what it is, it's the blind men, and yet they all see an elephant. Well, they wouldn't know that they saw an elephant if they didn't already have the idea of an elephant in their minds, and that's the point of the Romans passage. They have an idea of an elephant in their minds, and that's what allows them to piece it together, but it's not the hero with, it's not the face of the thousand faces that does it, it's the underlying thing. That's what suggests it. And a, and a good myth, a true myth, will give that fully articulated, and that's what scripture reveals then. I, th I think Tolkien believes that. Yes? I think it's interesting even because when you think of, um, like, from a psychologist perspective, Carl Jung, who... Archetypes, yep. Archetypes, and like this collective unconsciousness. Like, to me, when I read that, I think you're pointing at something that is true, except you're just not able to perceive it. And of course, he grew up in home and Christian society and so it's that idea that archetypes and myths have a lower level of truth to them. Right and I say the other way around they have a higher level of truth to them. Yeah but Jordan Peterson is following in the Jung's the Jungian school of archetypal theories and, and it, it and what it's saying is that the word is less important than what lies beneath the word and that's not Tolkien's position the word is the reality it, it, it signposts it, but it, it, it's a part of the reality itself. You can't change the word for, for um, uh, Jung and also for Northrop Frye and also for Jordan Peterson. It's the idea and not the word. And this is a problem and it leads to a sort of a Gnosticism. And again, it leads to a sort of a dependency on a hierarchy and it leads to a sense of a lack of visible accountability. Or, or contradiction, of, like a contradiction in language and so forth. I know that they're not wholly self-contradicting, but I, I think that the, that view, of the archetypal view, the hero with a thousand faces, it's saying something that seems right, but it's also so, totally off. It's got it totally 100% wrong, in, in my view. And it's certainly not what Tolkien's saying and what Lewis is maintaining. And it's not saying that there's a, a true myth because it's, it's, they're not all m true myths. There's one true myth. And the others might be echoes of that in some ways, but they're also distortions, and they're certainly not allegories of it. Although there are resemblances, for sure. And, and anybody who studies literature will see the echoes of Christian truth and Christian story in other stories, other cultural stories. And that's actually part of the um, way in which um, missionaries operate in new cultures is they they listen to the people that they're speaking to when they learn to <coughs> understand their languages and what are what are your accounts of yourself and they'll find the common notes like in here in where it's Gitchi Manitou or whatever right the Huron Carol um, but they're gonna say actually it's not the earth goddess that leads to Baalism uh, the New Testament uh, gods and goddesses are almost always tied with fertility rites and with the earth goddess and so forth and they lead to chaos and they lead to exploitation and perversity. So there's something that is right here but there's also something deeply wrong. It's, it's again like Augustine said with the Egyptians, there's gold here but it needs to be plundered and it needs to be uh, retooled so that it, it's, it, it signifies the thing it's supposed to signify. So it's not that there's no truth in it, a culture, but it, it's always distorted and it, if you say it's saying the same thing in a different way, you've misunderstood how language works. I hear it here all the time, by the way, at Tyndale, it drives me crazy. I think these people don't know, what, they don't know what they're talking about, they don't, know, they don't even know the, the uh, terms of engaging with the topic. It's very, it's not easy, it's not a, an easy straightforward thing. But it's not the simplistic that 
everyone deserves to have their story told, although I actually do believe that uh, in one sense, but it doesn't mean it's valid just because you tell it, right? And that's the question is validity. What is the valid true story? Uh, that includes everybody, because that, that's the thing about the, the account of the fall is that it refers to all mankind. It's the account of the beginning, and the beginning is of not just a group or a nation, it's of all peoples. So that is already the inclusive account. Um, anyway, I, so I, it depends, how, yeah, I shouldn't speak so categorically against it, um, because there are ways in which it can be played out in which it is uh, acceptable. But in general, what I hear is like, no, you've <laughs> thrown out the baby with the bathwater on this. Or you think the baby is the bathwater, or the bathwater is the baby. Anyway. Because God is in all of them. Anyway. Um, isn't that wonderful, the Mythopoeia? And it does it, and again, he's directing this to Lewis. And he, he, he's answering some of his objections. Now, we weren't there for the conversation, but it has been recounted elsewhere. I, I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient. Lewis would have been articulating something of the order of our, a Darwinian account of humankind and also how myths evolve and so forth. Um, and uh, I'm not sure he's entirely satisfied with it himself, but, uh, but he does mention it. And where is the, oh, wish fulfillment. That's what, again, the uh, lives breathe through, through silver. Here's a reality we wish were true. And I love it because I would love this to be true. I just love the story. I wish, like the children who wrote C.S. Lewis and said that they loved Aslan more than Jesus and whatever, and then Lewis was like, <gasps> oh no, what have I done? Right back and so forth. Um, because your, your wishes, and you think, if I led a child astray here, you've not understood what I'm doing here, or trying to do. Um, and so, the, again, the, the, the psychological view is that's what, that's what art, artistry does, is it's projecting our desires on reality. It's sort of a utopian wish that it were so, but it's not so. Tolkien says, no, it is as we desire, and it's even greater than we could ever have imagined. So there's a, like, it's the leaf niggle thing. There's a little leaf, and that's true, but we have no idea how big the tree is, of which we, like, if we just describe the tree, or the, the leaf here, and get it in all of its beauty and its uh, connection with a reality that's, that's much larger than it, then we've done something great. But the tree, is far beyond our comprehension, even our imagination. He get, again, at the end of Leaf by Nigel, he, he finally sees the tree, and he's just overwhelmed with joy. Um, but of course, he's, he's a niggling little man. Yeah. Self-description. Again, the humility of the artist there, I think, is, uh, has something to recommend it as well. Anyone else, comments, questions? Um, I can't remember what we have. I do have um, on fairy and fairy stories uh, on the syllabus. I think I will talk about that, uh, but then I'm going to want to get into the Lord of the Rings. So um, as far as how I'm going to do that, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and take it chronologically a little bit, deal with the fellowship and then deal with the two towers and then deal with the return of the king. But I'm not going to stick by it entirely because there's certain themes I want to trace throughout the whole thing all along, and so I'll I'll I'll, I'll follow it chronologically, and then I'll cheat and I'll give away plot lines later. So if you haven't read it yet, I apologize, um, but uh, there's nothing I can do about it. I want to not just go through it like step by step, but trace the uh, the design of it, and I'll do it more next time in connection with Tolkien's larger leg legendarium. So the whole edifice, so from the Silmarillion to the Unfinished Tales, and, and how that all fits together. Uh, the Hobbit, <coughs> I'll just say a little bit about that, uh, but we'll, we'll do that next time, okay?